thank you for uh, inviting me out this afternoon um, and this evening. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do at the weather service and, uh, and some things involved with uh, weather. I have a few brochures in the back that you're welcome to take, uh, one about the weather service, one about weather safety, and also one about weather radio. And so when I, whenever I go out to talk to a group, no matter what the subject is, I always got to throw in weather safety. That's, uh, that's really our mission, is to issue our, all our watches, warnings, advisories, our forecasts for the protection of life and property for the citizens across the United States. So uh, d these are just a few pictures of our weather service office up there in White Lake. We're officially called the weather service office at Detroit Pontiac, uh, but technically we're in the, in the tiny community of White Lake up there. Uh, and so just to give you a feel for what it looks like around our property. So what we'll talk about today is uh, who the National Weather Service is, what we do, some of the tools that we use in the weather forecasting, weather safety. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about our, our flood, our big flood event that we had last year since it hit this community uh, so hard. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the severe weather that we have and some weather resources that you can use uh, to, to get notification of those watches and warnings and advisories. And along the way, if you have any questions, don't, don't hesitate to stop me. I mean, that's part of the reason why I'm here is to answer your questions. So uh, I'll, otherwise I'll talk for about 50 minutes, but uh, I'm, I'm here to answer those questions, so I'll gladly take those. So at the National Weather Service, we're part of the federal government. Uh, we're under uh, the Department of Commerce. And underneath the Department of Commerce is NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And so the Weather Service is underneath there. Some of our sister agencies are the National Ocean Service, National Marine Fisheries, and also the Office of Atmospheric Research, Oceanic and Atmospheric Research. Uh, so those are some of the agencies underneath NOAA, all are dealing with the oceans and the atmosphere. The map that's up there is sort of the puzzle piece of how our offices are all pieced together with our area of responsibility. So we have 122 weather service offices. Our office, uh, I'll show a little bit closer view of that, covers southeast Michigan. Uh, we have our own area of responsibility, but to our west we have Grand Rapids, to the north we have Gaylord. And the Upper Peninsula is going to be covered by the office in Marquette. We have nine national centers. Uh, they're doing work on a, on a larger scale, uh, assisting sort of the national customer uh, and user, uh, like the Weather Channel and National News. But they also uh, coordinate with the local offices so all the forecast information gets out there. So the Storm Prediction Center, they're ultimately in charge of issuing the tornado watches and severe thunderstorm watches, although the local office will help con contribute to that. Uh, Climate Prediction Center usually makes uh, big news in October and November when they issue their winter outlooks. Everybody's interested in how this winter is going to pan out, and so their official outlook uh, it comes out in October and then an update in November although they'll make climate forecasts out for 12 and 13 months. So they actually do a, a long range forecast. Uh, some of the other national centers that you might know about is the Hurricane Center. They're gonna be making big news uh, over the next uh, four or five days as uh, Joaquin uh, moves up the Eastern Seaboard. So at our office, we cover 17 counties of Southeast Michigan. We go from the tip of the thumb, Midland and Bay uh, City, all the way down through Metro Detroit down to the Ohio border. So all the watches, warnings, forecasts uh, out for seven days, are, we have that responsibility. We also issue forecasts for, and warnings for Lake Huron, Lake St. Clair, and the Michigan waters of Lake Erie. So we have some of the marine responsibility. We also issue aviation forecasts for the airports, uh, the six major hubs that we have that deal with passenger and cargo and charter type of flights. So, Flint and Saginaw, Pontiac, the two Detroit airports, and Ypsilanti. So at each office, uh, we have a staff of meteorologists that study the weather, Hydro usually one hydrologist per office that worries about when all that rain hits the ground, how it's going to flood or move into our rivers, lakes, and streams. 
And then we also have a staff of electronics technicians that are going to work on all the computer systems that you see. We are there 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Uh, if it's a holiday in the middle of the night, we always have at least two to three people on duty ready to issue the forecasts and warnings. Uh, weather happens all the time. We know that. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a holiday, it's the middle of the night. We have to be ready to issue the warnings, and that's why we are fully staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with always at least two to three people on duty. If we have severe weather, chances are we're going to have a lot more than that, maybe four or five people to deal with winter storm, anywhere from six to ten people on staff working a severe thunderstorm or a tornado event. So when we look at our severe weather, uh, we're almost through 2015, so we thought we'd give you the 2015 stats at least through August. Uh, September's not quite yet complete. I guess we've got a few hours left, so we, won't, we can't put the September stats up there. But uh, 2015 thus far has been a relatively quiet year. Uh, we've had a few uh, significant events that we'll talk about, but uh, the, the graph on the far right shows 2015, and you can see the bar is just not as high as our seven-year average, or even last year, 2014, which was a record year for the number of severe weather events in southeast Michigan. So we generally are going to average around 300 severe thunderstorm events, whether it's wind, hail, or tornadoes. Uh, this doesn't count sort of winter storms or floods or anything like that. And then the differences in the coloration is what month all the severe weather activity hit. So last year in 2014, you can see the green bar on top and the blue in the middle. July and S September were our big months. This year, of course, every year is a little bit different. This year, our big, um, big month was August. And so that uh, makes up the, the majority of the events. Uh, on here, we list what our severe thunderstorm uh, criteria is. So when we talk about severe thunderstorm events, tornado is kind of obvious. We know that's a severe weather event. Our severe thunderstorm warnings are issued based on when we have a 58 mile hour wind gust potential. And that's where damage starts to occur. Trees fall over. Uh, limbs can break off that can crash through windows, damage cars, things like that. Or we have hail one inch in diameter or larger. And that's where damage starts to occur to your cars uh, at that one inch mark. Uh, you get those pings on the roof and trunk and hood and things like that. It has nothing to do with lightning and nothing to do with the amount of rainfall. If we get enough rain, uh, we're going to issue a flood warning. Every thunderstorm has lightning and has that potential to cause um, injury or even death. And so we don't issue a warning for every thunderstorm that's out there. Uh, we kind of rely on weather safety messaging to let you know that every thunderstorm you need to be indoors for. So some of our big events, uh, we had um, a tornado outbreak on June 22nd, spanning into June 23rd, right around the midnight hours. And so the biggest portion of the uh, uh, tornadic event was a, a tornado that w formed just east of Birch, Birch Run and then uh, ended just south of the town of Millington. Uh, that tornado was rated an EF2. Now we rate our tornadoes on a scale from zero to five, and we call that scale the EF scale or the enhanced Vegeta scale. And so the um, little graph on the far right kind of shows us uh, what wind speeds we get out of an EF2 tornado, 110 to 135 miles an hour. Uh, also during that event, we had a, a, a very long track tornado across Sanilac County here. That was actually on the ground for over 20 miles, and it hit that big dairy farm, if you remember some of the news uh, items from June 22nd. And then the other big tornado event we had was uh, one way up there in the tip of the thumb in Owendale on August 2nd. August 2nd was our biggest severe weather event as far as the number of severe weather uh, reports that we got into our office of wind and hail. Uh, so most of it occurred north of Detroit, but we did have a few scattered reports down here in Metro Detroit. So some of the things that we have available at our office to issue those warnings for the severe thunderstorm, for those tornado events, we use our Doppler radar system. Uh, it sits on a tower about 100 feet tall at our office, continuously spinning around to look at 
uh, the weather data and the weather uh, precipitation, whether it's snow or rain. On a, on a clear day, it may just be sampling some of the clouds, but it's always spinning around looking for weather targets. And so the output that you see on the internet, you see on local television, you see on your phone apps, uh, it basically shows you where the rain is at and how hard the rain is falling and then you can get into more depth with the radar imagery and, and, and figure out whether it's a severe storm or not. Uh, we have satellites up there uh, rotating with the Earth. Uh, those satellites are up there at about 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface and they're always taking pictures. Uh, so we have one over the East Coast, one over the West Coast, one over the islands of Hawaii and Guam, and a couple up there are spares, always sampling uh, what's happening with the atmosphere. It's never steady state. There's always stuff changing, whether it's increasing in strength, decreasing in strength. Stuff comes together, stuff gets pulled apart, uh, and the satellite data allows us to see that. There's a lot of observation that goes on, not only with radar, and satellite systems, but we have automated weather sensors out there uh, at airports measuring the temperature, the wind, relative humidity. And we have spotters that will help us be the eyes and ears for us out there to let us know if we have a severe thunderstorm developing. Uh, I mentioned how we have an average of 300 severe weather events that occur across southeast Michigan. Well, it's not that they're measured at airports that we get that. We rely on our spotters to go out uh, and, and report that to us. Most of our spotters are just at home waiting for the severe weather to hit their house and give us a call. And so you can, you can attend spotter training. Uh, I'll talk about it when I look at our webpage uh, where you can find the details about spotter training. We have it in the springtime prior to severe weather season. But we also offer training in the fall, much more limited, but we offer training in the fall for winter spotter training because we need the reports of snowfall as well. Finally, we have upper air observations. I mentioned there's 122 weather service offices across the country. We actually will launch weather balloons two times a day every day of the year at about 90 of those weather service sites. And there are close to a thousand sites across the world that will launch weather balloons. And these balloons are launched at the exact same time. And it coordinates with Greenwich Mean Time or the time in London, England. So it coordinates to midnight and noon in London. Uh, for us, that works out to a six or seven o'clock launch, whether it's in the morning or in the evening. And whether on daylight time or standard time, it'll all change. Uh, so folks in the weather service that work in the Alaska region, they're launching their weather balloons at like 1 a.m. and then 1 p.m. Uh, so I, what that gives us is it samples the atmosphere. We measure all the way up to 100,000 feet. And the key reason for that is weather doesn't just happen down here on the ground. It does happen all the way up to 50,000 feet higher than the jet airliners fly. And the balloon goes higher than, than the data that we actually need. Um, and, and we continue to sample that. The idea of sending up a weather balloon is straight from the 1930s. So it's basically 1930s technology that we're using. The instrumentation on there is much more modern than that, but the idea of sending up a weather balloon and getting a radio signal back to our office is straight from the 1930s and there's still nothing better to use. Yeah, uh, we can use, yeah. Are you, are you willing to take questions? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we're looking at possibility for drones for storm surveying. Uh, whenever we have a tornado uh, or a question about tornado, um, sometimes with the floods, we're going out to survey the damage, to rate the tornadoes, to create a database. So we have a very, um, very th elaborate database of our tornado damage. And so we do use that. Um, but. You know, there is a possibility that drones could be used for storm surveying. Uh, there's not roads going everywhere. Uh, so if the tornado moves across a big swampland area here in southeast Michigan, it may be on the ground for four or five miles between roads. And so if we see damage at the beginning of that and damage at the end, we just kind of assume that the damage continues in there. So that's a possibility that it could be used. 
for that. Um, for actually measuring the weather, um, I'm not so sure we're going to be able to use that because to get that data back and to assimilate it and to use it for a forecast process, um, we would most likely use that for short fuse thunderstorm type of forecasting because uh, the drones have to the drones are going to stay pretty low. Uh, so I don't know if we're going to ever use it for observations, but maybe after the storms we could use that. All right, uh, just a couple last minute things on the weather balloon. Um, when we get that data back, it does help us with the forecast uh, on the short term. I mean, we're going to look at that forecast data uh, to make a forecast of rain versus snow, whether we're going to have thunderstorms or not. Are those thunderstorms going to be severe or tornadic? And we can use that kind of as a short term forecast, next six to 10 hours. But all of this data, radar data, satellite, all the observations, all the weather balloon data, it gets piled into supercomputers where they generate forecasts. And certainly anyone that's going to be watching uh, Hurricane uh, Joaquin, they're going to hear a lot about the computer models. And those computer models are fed with data like this. Uh, and I should also mention we have those weather balloons. Uh, most of the eastern half of the United States will be sending up weather balloons four times a day instead of two times a day with an approaching hurricane just to make sure we have more data, more computer model runs so that we can have as accurate forecasts as possible, keep people out of harm's way, and, uh, and have people evacuate if they need to as quickly as possible. All right, a little more detail, a little closer view of the weather balloons. The data that we measure from the instrument is four things, pressure, temperature, relative humidity, and wind speed and direction. So those are the four things that we measure. As, as, I, as I said, it really is the best technology that we have. This is sort of the modern look at what the weather instrument looks like. Um, satellites can measure a lot of this data, but if there's a layer of clouds, over Michigan, for example, we can't measure the temperature and the relative humidity and the wind speed below the cloud layer. We can use radars to shoot uh, beams upward and measure that data, but if there's a low cloud or fog in the way, again, we can't measure temperature and dew point above the fog and cloud. So it's still our best way that we get that uh, information. Yes? Yeah, after about two hours, they're carried by the wind. They get up to 100,000 feet, and what ends up happening is there's less air pressure up there. Uh, anyone that's been in a jet airliner, their, your ears pop to adjust to the different air pressure. Our balloon expands to adjust to the air pressure, and eventually expands to the size of a very big backyard shed or a very tiny house. It expands one more time, and it pops, and then it falls back down to the ground. And so this orange thing that's on here, that's a parachute, because falling from 100,000 feet, we could damage a building or hurt somebody, and we don't want that to happen. And so yeah, our, uh, the balloons and the instruments come back down. Nationally, about 20% of them are recovered, and there's information on the instrument itself on how to send it back to the weather service. We can recycle them or use them again. Uh, our return rate is much lower. Uh, most of our balloons end up in Lake Huron, Lake Erie, or in Canada. And so even the Canadians, if they find it, they can't send it back because the mail pouch is U.S. postage only. So, so I know our rate is much lower than 20%. Um, my understanding is that a lot of the material that's made out of is biodegradable, so we're not polluting the, atmosphere, the, uh, the ground too much. Uh, and so that, you know, there's not a bunch of weather balloon debris in Lake Huron or Lake Erie or anything like that. So as I mentioned, all that data goes into these computer models. Now, the computer models are far from perfect. Uh, they serve as our first guess as to what's going on in the atmosphere. And then we don't have just one to look at. Uh, we're, the United States runs two main computer models. Um, and then we have other computer models that look at different aspects of the weather. Some of them only go out for 18 hours to forecast thunderstorm development. Some computer models go out for uh, really for months, like two to three months. 
truthfully, when we use our computer models, we're looking at a forecast seven days out. And beyond seven days, we try to forecast warmer or colder, wetter or drier. Because uh, the details beyond seven days just really aren't worth it. The average temperature error for a day seven forecast is plus or minus six degrees. So you're talking about a 12, 13 degree spread. Uh, and it gets even wider the farther you go out in time. So I mentioned we have computer models, Canadians, the Europeans, the British, uh, they all have computer models. I mean, we can look on, and we get that data ingested into our office. Uh, we can go online and look at the Navy's computer model, the Japanese computer model, and they all offer a little different flavor. Sometimes one computer model outperforms the other. Sometimes it's one model on two days, and then it's another model for the next five days. And again, that's where we got to use our meteorology. Sometimes the, all of them are not good. And so we kind of use our meteorology to know which ones are good, which ones are bad, and kind of put together the picture of what the atmosphere looks like and what the forecast is. A little closer view of our Doppler radar. Uh, it is the world's most powerful Doppler radar. And we don't just look at the lowest levels of the storm. We actually sample the entire atmosphere. So the, when the radar beam uh, turns around, uh, it shoots at 0.5 degrees, and then it'll go up to 1.5, and eventually all the way up to 20 degrees. As I mentioned, we look at the data on the television, on our apps, on the web pages, and most of the time we're just looking at where the rain is at, where it's going, and how heavy the rain is. We're all used to seeing the blues and the greens being the light rain, and the reds and the purples being the heavy rain. Uh, but that doesn't tell us all the details of the storm. Uh, we also have the Doppler part of the radar, and we know Doppler radar is, is talked about as promotional for most of our television stations. Well, the Doppler part really allows us to look inside the storm. So when we look at this, everything in green is moving towards our radar site, and that radar site's near the bottom of that picture, near the donut hole. And so everything in green is towards the radar, everything in red is away from the radar. And where those red and green couplets are together, that's a rotating thunderstorm. And that rotating thunderstorm uh, is a trait of a severe thunderstorm. As that rotation gets tighter, faster, and lower to the ground, then we get worried about tornadoes, and we can issue tornado warnings before the tornado ever hits the ground. So since we talked about all this uh, you know, severe thunderstorms, it's a good idea to talk about some safety. And I always have to talk about safety wherever I'm at. Lightning, by definition, every thunderstorm has lightning with it. And we, have a, we really have a simple rule. When thunder roars, go indoors. The reason for that uh, like in this case right here where we have lightning, uh, it's actually out ahead of the rain area. And so in our average thunderstorm, we can have lightning arc out of the thunderstorm and strike areas that are 5 to 10 miles from the rain area. That's an average thunderstorm. So if you wait until the rain starts to fall, you've put yourself at risk. So whenever you hear thunder, that's nature's way of telling you, time to go inside. Now when you're inside, uh, don't use uh, your shower, don't use extra electric appliances. Uh, we're not telling you to turn off uh, the refrigerator and unplug that. Uh, but if your home is hit by lightning, uh, you know, damage can be caused from the lightning traveling through the electric circuits. Most people are still injured uh, in thunderstorms by talking on the telephone. So, uh, the corded telephone. Now, if you have a cell phone, a cordless phone, you're going to be okay. The base of that cordless phone may be fried, but uh, you won't have the ear damage that you get if you talk on a corded telephone. Um, when outdoors, uh, don't take shelter in those uh, open gazebo picnic shelters. I know a lot of our golf courses like to have those with lightning rods on them. That doesn't make them any safer. Um, <laughs> So a good place to go, if you're in a park-like setting and you don't have a permanent building to get to, is a hardtop automobile. Now, a convertible doesn't work, even if the roof's up, because it's not a complete metal cage that surrounds you. You need to have that, that metal cage surrounding you. Uh, it's called a Faraday cage, and that's what protects you from lightning. And so a vehicle can offer protection there. Uh, for flood safety, Got a little video. Sorry. 
So with hail, our basic safety rules when we issue that severe thunderstorm warning, get away from the outside walls, get away from the windows. When we issue a severe thunderstorm, it's hail that's big enough that can break windows, and obviously we want to stay away from the flying, um, flying uh, glass if windows do break. So that's a, that's a southeast Michigan picture from April of 2014. So we had hail about one inch in diameter, severe hail, uh, but it piled up, as you can see, it looks like snow. And since it was early April, there was no leaves on the tree, so it really looks like it was snow. Um, this is a hail, hail event from July 27th of last year where it got up to as much as baseball size up in Island Township, just west of our office. And that one right there is from Bay City in 2012, so that's, that is just under base, or just at baseball size, just under three inches in diameter. So needless to say, if that's falling, it's gonna break your um, windows. Uh, one of the most amazing things about hail that always, um, I'm always reminded about every time we have a big hail event, is it is really non-discriminatory about what it damages. Uh, every roof, every uh, piece of siding, whether it's wood or vinyl, uh, bricks hold up a little bit better, and, and then windows. So we had a hail event, uh, the one down here uh, on July 27th, and it hit Highland Township, and we also had had hail hit just north of Bay City and north of Midland, but not the two cities proper. And they both had baseball size hail. Those two hail events on the same day caused over $100 million worth of damage. And it didn't even hit big population centers. So we moved the Highland storm down here, or we have the Midland and Bay County storms about 10 miles south into Midland and Bay City, city proper, you know, we probably would have been, you know, closer to $500 million worth of damage. So just incredible amount of damage hail causes. So this is a little video from Oklahoma. That is what baseball size hail looks like when it's uh, falling. You'll see some of them on the deck and around that tree in the planter. So you get an idea of, you know, how loud it is and, you know, sort of what it looks like <laughs> when, when those hailstones are hitting. Uh, so when we issue our severe thunderstorm warnings for winds, we're issuing at 58 miles an hour or greater. Uh, again, stay in the center part of the building, away from windows. We issue those for 58 mile an hour winds that can cause trees to fall over, large limbs to break, and then especially your community where you have so many trees, uh, you, it may fall over on your property uh, and on your home. So you want to stay away from those outside walls. So the center part of the house is going to be much more structurally sound. And so just some of the different looks of a couple of severe thunderstorm events across the time, across Southeast Michigan. For tornado safety, uh, we need you to get to your basement if you have one available. And when you're in your basement, get underneath the stairs. I know that's a good storage spot and I should practice what I preach and clean it out a little bit more. I know if I got a tornado headed to my house, I'm going to be throwing you know, rubber made bins out of, the, out of the storage spot. But it really is the best place for you to be. Because if your home is hit by a tornado, debris falls into the basement. So you want to protect yourself from the falling debris. Um, if you have a really solid workbench down there, that might be okay too. I know I have a particle board computer desk down there. I'm not going underneath that thing. That thing's going to fall apart with any little thing falling from the sky. 
Uh, if you don't have a basement available, you want to go to the lowest floor and put as many walls between you and the tornado as possible. So if you have windows in the room that you're thinking of taking shelter, that is not good enough. There you only have one wall between you and the tornado. So get into a closet, the small hallway, a bathroom is a good option, especially if it doesn't have an outside wall, it's an interior bathroom. That plumbing kind of is more anchored than any other place. If you're driving, you need to find a sturdy shelter. That's your only option. Now, here in Metro Detroit, you have lots of options to find a sturdy shelter. There's lots of businesses, a lot of businesses are open 24 seven now. And so you should be able to get into a permanent structure. If there is no permanent structure available, uh, the safety tips that we have are ways that we're gonna try to minimize the threat to your life, but they're not safe alternatives. <clears throat> so you can get into the ditch and hopefully all the flying debris goes over your head, but you still run the risk of falling debris. The other thing that uh, is recommended is, uh, at that point, just trying to save lives, is if you have a tornado right there and you're in the open country and there's no building to get into, you can stay in your vehicle, buckle up, and get below the window level. Windows are gonna be blown out, so you wanna protect yourself from that. And there you're just playing the odds that 90% of all tornadoes are EF0 and EF1. Your car may flip over once or twice, but that is survivable. And so you're just playing the odds that 90% of the tornadoes are EF0 and EF1s. So the ditch or staying in the car, neither one sound like good options to me. So I'm going to try to stay up to date with the forecast, know when there's tornado watches and tornado warnings being issued, and get to a permanent building at all costs. Yeah. So you want to get out of the car and get as far away from the car as possible. Preferably, you want to be upstream of the car, because if the tornado is coming from the west, you want a, the car to be to your east, because you don't want that uh, car to roll over on you. So you want to get as far away from the car as possible. Yeah. The other thing about the ditch that I failed to mention is that ditch is going to fill up with water. And so it could be a flood situation, too. So like I said, there's only one one answer for tornado safety, a permanent building. Mobile homes don't offer protection either. Um, now in your home, uh, whether it's in your basement or uh, the lowest floor in a, in a um, if you don't have a basement available and you're in your bathroom, in your closet, uh, you wanna protect yourself from all that falling debris, all that uh, flying debris that may be around. So grab pillows and blankets and um, anything to protect yourself from that flying debris. Uh, during the tornado watch, it might be a good idea to go out to your garage and grab a bicycle or motorcycle helmet. If that's going to protect you while you're falling off of a bike, it might protect you a little bit from flying debris. And so the CDC did some studies with some violent tornadoes just to see how successful that was. And it may be able to save up to 40% of tornado fatalities you know, just by putting on a bicycle helmet. They're doing more research just to make sure that's a good number. but. You know. We want you to do that at the watch point because if there's a tornado coming towards your house, that's not the time to go to the garage and say, where's my bike helmet? We want you to, want you to have that prepared for you. Sure. Yes. My, my son claims that um, in case of tornado winds, he can go in the basement and tie himself to the plumbing so that the wind can't take you out of the house. Is that true? Um, not not really. I mean, the plumbing is the most anchored part of the house, uh, but if you're in the basement, uh, the most important thing is to get underneath the stairs to protect yourself from falling debris, because that's, okay. that's by far and away the bigger hazard. Uh, I don't know of any cases in particular where someone was actually pulled out of a basement where you would tie yourself to anything. So some of the tornadoes that we've had around uh, Southeast Michigan, the 2012 Dexter tornado was an EF3 tornado, which is the biggest tornado we've had in the last 20 years. Um, and at EF3 level, you lose outside walls, uh, all of the roof structure, and just really interior walls are left standing. Uh, on that same day, we had a EF0 tornado down in Ida. 
and just a panoramic view of some EF2 type of damage in Dexter. Uh, in 2013, we had EF2 tornadoes in Genesee County near Fenton, uh, and then also in Goodrich, and a picture of one of the tornadoes there. And so with that talk on safety, we can talk a little bit more about some of the specific events. Uh, we had the big flood event just over a year ago. And so with this, let's just kind of look at, uh, we just have our, our satellite picture here with our storm system that affected us. Uh, this is our radar loop. I'll, I'll play this one for you so you can see all the terrain. Must be a big radar loop. It's going to take its time to load up. Or maybe not. Well, I apologize that that didn't work. I'm not sure why, why that didn't load up for us. Let's give it one more try. But the things that caused this, uh, this historic flood event is we had uh, really a record amount of moisture in the atmosphere for that time of year. Now August can have a lot of moisture in it. I mean August is a very humid month around these parts. But it was even more humid than normal. And it was actually near record levels amount of moisture in the atmosphere based on that weather balloon that we sent up. Uh, we had a strengthening area of low pressure and it was especially strong for mid-August. Uh, our winter storms tend to be stronger areas of low pressure. The summertime low pressures tend to be weaker. But for mid-August, it was actually kind of like a fall system uh, as far as the strength of the low pressure. So that really helped uh, squeeze out all that moisture that we had. Um, our wind profile uh, in the and all the layers of the atmosphere were favorable for training convection. What that means is we had thunderstorms form, and they just um, they continued to form over southern Wayne County and then moved northward across Metro Detroit. And so for about two or three hours, they were forming over the airport, basically, and they just kept moving northeastward uh, across Oakland and Macomb counties. Um, the thunderstorms themselves did provide some intense rainfall. Uh, we had widespread areas that received uh, up to an inch and a half per hour rainfall rates. Uh, and then, of course, the heaviest fell over the urbanized area. We have a lot of concrete around here, and so it's hard for that to soak into the ground. And so it immediately runs off into low spots, into the rivers, streams, and creeks. And, uh, and so that really caused the uh, big impacts. Uh, one of the other things that we look at is our flash flood guidance. So we, we kind of pixelate southeast Michigan. And so areas actually up here in Saginaw and Bay City, which also had flooding that day, uh, along with uh, Metro Detroit's urban area, our, our flash flood guidance said we could only really take about one and a half to two and a half inches of rain in three hours. And unfortunately, we ended up with, like at Metro Airport, our final total was like 4.7 inches in those three hours. And City Airport was pretty close to the same. So this is the total amount of rainfall that occurred with most of it being between like 4 and 7 o'clock. Uh, a lot of our river streams uh, reached flood stage very quickly with the rain. They had a couple of records, Ecorse Creek down in Wayne County, and then the Clinton River in Clinton Township hit all-time record highs uh, for the amount of water. And I think that's a picture of some of the Clinton River flooding that we had. And the rainfall totals for that day, uh, Detroit Metro again was 4.57 
which was the second wettest day in Detroit's history. Um, and uh, Saginaw and Flint both were between two and three inches. So all time record for any one day was way back there in 1925 of 4.74. So uh, some areas though had even more than that. And you can see Southeast Oakland County in that uh, maximum area with uh, six inches plus. And that all really occurred in about three to four hour time window. And again, our flash flood guidance said about one and a half to two and a half inches of rain is all we could take in a three hour window. And so we ended up with double to maybe close to three times what we could take. And that's why the flooding was so widespread and so, um, and really so bad. So this particular flood event uh, 2014 wasn't a big flood year for the United States, but this particular flood event uh, accounted for 70% of all of U.S. flood damages in 2014. So that puts it in some perspective. Again, it was a it was a low year for flooding, uh, so that also kind of contributes to it. By far and away, it was the costliest weather disaster in the state of Michigan in our history. Uh, and the damage is somewhere between one billion and one, maybe as high as $1.8 billion in damage uh, across Metro Detroit. Uh, just outrageous. So the thunderstorms that we've been talking about, um, I'll, I'll go through these slides real quickly because I do want to get to the resources. That's probably the most important part here. Um, we've talked a lot about severe weather safety. Uh, whether it's uh, tornadoes, thunderstorms. And these are the thunderstorms that cause all the uh, damage. And we have four types of thunderstorms that we talk about. Our single cell storms are just your generic summertime thunderstorms. They're very brief. Most thunderstorms are in the single cell category and only last for about 30 to 40 minutes. But we can get it, some isolated severe weather out of these storms, like maybe a one inch hail storm, maybe, maybe a tree coming down with a brief of wind. Our multicellular storms either come in in a group of storms as a cluster of storms. Those are the ones that cause flooding, like on August 11th of 2014. Or we can have a line of storms uh, called a squall line. And the squall line can produce tremendous wind gust uh, with it. So these are a little bit more intense, more dangerous. But the most intense storm are our supercell storms. So those all the tornadic events I've been talking about June 22nd and 23rd of this year, the Dexter, Michigan tornado, those all formed out of supercell storms. It's the most intense storm and they're the ones most likely to cause baseball size hail, uh, wind gusts up to 100 miles an hour and the, the tornadoes that get produced. So I just, uh, well these radar loops are gonna work for me, that's good. <laughs> so here we have just uh, you know these random cells that pop up and they dissipate just as quickly that's kind of what a single cell, typical summertime day uh, looks like. The storms develop and they dissipate almost as quickly as they develop. No real organization to it. Our multi-cell cluster storm, especially up in here, you can see how the storms just keep generating over this area of Michigan. And this was a flood event that we had in Flint where we got about four or five inches of rain overnight. They had to rescue people from an apartment complex that were flooded at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in the morning. Squall line of storms, you can see it's a line of storms and that leading edge is where most of the wind comes through. This one was back on 2010 and I believe it produced 70 mile an hour winds in this community and down quite a few trees um, on this particular squall line. And then lastly, our supercell storm is these isolated storms, very intense have a lot longer lifetime to them, can last two to three hours, and this is the Dexter, Michigan supercell storm right there. All right, I wanna get to our resources here real quick. I do have a video of a tornado. I can't have a weather service talk without a video of a tornado. And it's, it's almost like a law, right? so I can't do that. Well, we got a picture of a tornado for you. <laughs> so 
Uh, that's the picture of the Dexter tornado uh, right in there. And this was unusual in the fact of how classic it was. And you could, you could be in the right spot to look at the tornado, take pictures, and remain safe. In Michigan, most of our tornadoes are wrapped in rain or we have a lot of low clouds and fog. And so it was a little unusual in that sense that you could take a, a good picture of it. So when we talk about safety, we want to put together a plan. And for our weather safety plan, we really should have a weather radio for all seasons. Um, we have weather radio tower here in Detroit to broadcast for the metro community. They're programmable, so you can program in the county that you live in and for the events you want to be warned for. It'll make an alarm sound that is loud enough to wake you up. It's as loud as your alarm clock or smoke detector, and it really is as important to have in your house as a smoke detector. When we issue a tornado warning or a severe thunderstorm warning with a lot of wind, the sirens may go off. And those sirens are designed for outdoor warning. If you think about what information does a siren give you? Nothing, you just hear a sound. All it's telling you is to go inside and find out what's going on. And so when you're outdoors, backyard, in a park setting, they have a purpose to tell you to get inside and find out what's going on with the weather. Um, inside, have the television on, have the radio on, computer, cell phone, whatever the case. But if you don't have those available, uh, or you're not paying attention, or you're sleeping in the middle of the night, the weather radio will alert you to that. So it's like having your own personal warning alarm siren in your house. Our webpage is at weather.gov. That's for the, all of the weather services page. If you throw on a slash Detroit, you get to the local page. If you're interested in spotter training, it's gonna be in the news headline section. Um, and if you're interested in weather radio, we got a little section down here on weather radio. Uh, we'll go to a web page that has a little more warning, a little more action to the map. Um, if you click on that map, you'll get the details for any point in southeast Michigan. You get the watches and warnings, the current temperature, the current forecast. It's kind of your one-stop shop if you click on that map for your location. Um, News events are found in those news headlines, whether it's spotter training or an upcoming severe weather event. Uh, right now, the only thing we have on there is the Lake, El Lake Erie algae bloom, so we have that on there. Warnings show up, uh, and not only when you click the map, you'll get the warnings, but you have the warnings right there highlighted for you, and lots of other information. You can get our forecast on our webpage, but we also give the information out to television and radio. Uh, smartphone apps have a lot of our data. There's no weather service app out there. And we leave the app development for the private sector, but we provide most of the data that serves as the background. And you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Uh, we do get put out a lot of information on there, but we're not overbearing like some Twitter accounts can be. So uh, I, think we're, I think we're a good follow, uh, personally. So you can, you can find us on the social media platforms. So with that, I want to give you at least a little time to ask any questions that you have as a follow-up. Yeah. Um, last year's storm was called a one in a hundred year storm. Is that true? Or, you know, <laughs> yeah, it, in, the, in the world of hydrology, we do talk about flood events, rainfall and flood events, and um, return frequency. And so, yeah, they were terms like one in a hundred year. The thing is, we could have a one in a hundred year flood tomorrow. It, what it really means is you have about 1% chance of having that type of storm happen in any given year. And if you look over the course of a thousand years, yeah, you're probably only gonna have 10 of those events. But to go from year to year to year, you could get that a hundred year flood two years in a row, you could. Yeah. Um, probably the biggest trends in our severe weather is that, uh, and, and the research is pretty um, young and, and not fully developed on this, but with, um, I'm going to say the word, uh, with global warming and climate change, uh, 
what we have found is that it appears that there's a trend for less days of severe weather, but on the days that we get severe weather, it may be more intense. And that's certainly a trend we've seen in our data, and the people that are doing that sort of research have also seen that trend. Again, got to do more research to call that an actual finding, but uh, that's where we're leaning towards. Yeah. So any clues about this winter coming up? Yeah, this winter coming up, um, there is a strong El Nino uh, in progress across the Pacific Ocean. Now, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, you can have water temperatures that are average. Uh, you can have water temperatures uh, off of Peru and the eastern Pacific, uh, Ecuador, Peru, Peru area, that are colder than normal, called La Nina, or they, they could be warmer than normal, called El Nino. And so that's what we have right now is a big pool of warm water in the eastern half of the Pacific Ocean, especially off of Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, around the equator. It looks like it could be one of the strongest measured El Ninos of all time, competing with an 82-83 winter. And for those of you that remember Christmas Day of 82, with it being 65 degrees and thunderstorms, and I remember being at my grandmother's house and all the windows and doors being open and being really hot in there. Or uh, it could be like the, uh, it could be as strong as the El Nino of 97-98, which is the only February we've had in our history where we didn't even record a flake of snow in Detroit. So whether we have an extreme uh, response in our temperature pattern from El Nino, um, I'm not sure if we'll have records, but we will have a winter that is far different than our last two. It will be, it, it will be noticeably different, and there is a good chance that'll be so different that you'll be wondering, are we really living in the same place on the same planet? Uh, so the last two winters were almost as harsh as we can get. And if this pans out like 82, 83 or 97, 98, it could be as light as a winter can get around here. Now, both of those winters, we still had 20 to 30 inches of snow. We still had a snowstorm in there. So, and, and warmer than normal could mean temperatures around 40 and lots of clouds. Um, so it's still going to be winter. It's just not going to be sub-zero for the entire month of February like we were this year. Um, not necessarily competition. Uh, some of the private sector may run their own computer models, um, but most of their computer models are on a smaller time scale, uh, more uh, smaller scale models. Um, and so there's, there's really not a competition as much as different avenues that we operate in. Uh, we have the authority by Congress to issue the watches, warnings, and advisory and they wouldn't want to take that on anyway because of liability concerns. Um, As for a standard forecast, sometimes I, I can look at the National Weather site and get a forecast, and so I can go to the other site right. and forecast that sometimes can be more accurate. Um, well, and th that's just going to be depending on your perception and how, you know, different days and different forecasts and how that, how that all works out. I think the main thing between us and the public uh, private sector uh, it, it's really not so much whether we say mostly sunny and they say partly sunny and it's maybe partly sunny or, you know, it's a difference of a few degrees in temperature. As long as both of us are on the same page when it comes to the life safety, uh, that's what's really important. And, uh, and, and we work really well with the private sector uh, to, on the preparedness side before the event, getting the word out when it's a warning and uh, making sure you know, citizens of the United States are safe from those hazardous weather events. And that's, that's probably the most important thing, and there's not much difference uh, there. Just who, who is our audience that we're getting the word out to. Don't some of the TV stations have their own Doppler, or do they all rely on you? Um, 
some of the TV stations have a Doppler radar. Uh, they don't operate them anymore here in Metro Detroit. Um, uh, it's an expensive proposition to run the radar. Uh, we also serve the uh, Flint and Saginaw area, and they have two TV stations that still run uh, their own Doppler radars. So it just depends on the market and you know what the TV station wants to invest their money in. Yeah. But then when you look at two different TV stations and they come up with different forecasts, not really different, but are they just using different models or just one guy is rolling at night someplace? I mean, they say they're really deep out. How do they come up with different forecasts? Well, um, there's a lot of data to look at, a lot of computer models, and um, uh, in different levels of expertise, certainly, um, and not only in our office, I mean, we have a, a diversity among for our forecasters. Uh, so yeah, we can have those same differences among forecasters in our office. So uh, that's what you get with an inexact science uh, with that. Now hopefully, again, hopefully if it's a difference of 70 versus 75 and we're both saying sunny, you know, that's not a huge deal. Uh, but if it's a winter storm, uh, you know, hopefully we're on the same page. Now we may be saying 6 to 10 and we got somebody else saying 4 to 8 and somebody else saying 8 to 12. That's kind of getting far from there because there's a big difference between 4 and 12. But, uh, you know, we're still kind of you know, in a, in a ballpark there. No one's saying an inch while we have a winter storm warning out. And that's probably a, that's probably a key is that there's nothing too extreme. Uh, but yeah, you will notice differences and they're out there.